I only see positive mm. possibilities if we take action. We are facing an existential crisis and anyone in the spiritual realm is well aware of this. We may feel less lonely if we have a mission during this time. Our souls are calling us to an appointment with life. If we are wondering what to do, if we're thinking, where do I start? My absolute first answer is go and look at nature. When you do and you get in vibration with something greater than yourself, you become the light for everybody around you. We are a blip on the planet. We are a blip in the cycle of life. This is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. Wake up, people. Wake up. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever felt lonely, trapped, or disconnected from what's real, then do we have the This One Wild and Precious Life show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Sarah Wilson, former journalist and TV presenter, author, activist, and New York Times bestseller of books including I Quit Sugar and First We Make the Beast Beautiful, about her latest piece de resistance, This One Wild and Precious Life. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about how to reconnect, discover our wildness, and live a meaning-filled life. That plus we'll talk about hot and cool loneliness, a woman in red, Paris Siestes, what on earth is degrowth economics and what in the world a doomsday clock and kamikaze mode has to do with anything. <laughs> gotcha. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Are you ready to shine? I pretty much am after that introduction, Michael. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. So before we dive right into things, this is something that I did after near-death experience number one for different reasons. But you yanked your book back from the printer two days before it went to press. Why did you do that? Oh, well, like the answer to most things over the last 12 months, COVID hit. So it was two days before the print um, run was ready to go. And it, we, we got wind of this you know, new pandemic. And this was in March mm. and um, March 2020. And I said to my publisher, we've got to pull it back because I think this is going to shift the world. I'd been writing this book, as you know, for three years. And it, I'd been writing about this connection, fragmentation, about the fact that we as humans were lacking resilience to deal with kind of a, a fair bit of uncertainty, um, confusion and complexity that was ahead. And, of course, COVID was all of that. And I could see it. I don't think I was any expert. Um, however, I could see that this was going to really strike the globe and affect everything that I'd just written. So I went and positioned myself in a cabin out in the forest. Yeah. And um, we, we, we had a very serious lockdown here in Australia. But, of course, what it's meant is that we have zero cases. I think we got a couple of cases overnight, but they're coming in from overseas travellers, people coming back into Australia from overseas, and they sit in a hotel quarantine for two weeks. So we have got no community transmission in, in a nation of 23 million people. So we did a very serious lockdown. I went into lockdown and I sat and I watched the world. Now, during that time, Black Lives Matters, or those protests started to happen. So I sat a little longer and, of course, my publisher was getting pretty antsy. Um, however, really all I did was tweak and bring in these contemporary things to illustrate the point that I was making. It really didn't shift the book, Michael. It was, And it was so funny. My friend said to me, um, so, you know, uh, it was the pandemic, then Black Lives Matter. We had the bushfires as well. So Tremendous. That I don't my, even know that that's the right word, but the most historic is that the right word the most awful yes. there there's the word we want to go with mm. fires were, ever i mean it wiped out 20 percent of our forests and it killed over one billion some people are saying two billion animals um and it was horrific we had it was terrifying it was like armageddon so i was finishing the book in the first round during that period so we had all these things and my friend said to me sarah can you please get that book to the printers before martians land like i don't know what else is going to happen um so yes it was it was a very interesting process to go through and i'm glad i waited um because the book i think was able to be released at a time where it could be of best service where people could relate to what i was talking about and so all the theories 
that I pull apart mm. about capitalism, disconnection, technology, um, soul nerding, all of these things, uh, we, we were living them. We were having to experiment them with them throughout 2020. Um, and I think we're going to have to live by it for quite a long time to come. I do. I see huge positives in it. There's some parallels in our lives because this this is our book, Awe, the Automatic Writing Experience, how to basically dive in, go quiet, get guidance from the universe. And I lost my editor in August of last year because it was supposed to go to print. And I'm like, no, no, no. And and so I'm telling the publisher, breathe deep. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. I've got some more work to do. And then we had fires racing up to within a few miles of our door. We've never been back. We left our home. And, and so the parallels, the synchronicities are there. But I really have to believe, and, and, and I'm interested in your take, I only see, I know you don't, you, we should probably talk about the word optimist versus hope here. But I only see positive mm. possibilities if we take action in this time. Absolutely correct. And it's good that you distinguish between optimism and hope. So the difference is, is that optimism can be as dangerous as pessimism. Pessimism, of course, you go, there's no, there's no point, so I'm not going to go even try. And if we're talking about cl the climate crisis, if we're talking about the disconnection and fragmentation playing out in the world, we can see how that would work. Optimism is kind of similar. Oh, it'll all be okay, so I don't even have to try. Now, the difference is, is that hope is almost optimism with a very heavy dose of, of action. So I talk about this notion of a radical hope, and a radical hope is one where we don't know how it's going to turn out. We don't know what is going to become of this one wild and precious life. But what we need to do is engage in at, at our absolute best. And I have a, a belief, and this is what I came to believe in the writing of this book, is that we don't know where the planet's going to end up. We don't know where the virus is going to end up. Um, we are facing an existential crisis, and anyone in the spiritual realm is well aware of this. Um, and, you know, our spiritual practice is, is having to be heightened to be able to cope with what's ahead. We've got a responsibility, in fact, to do that. So um, I think that what I've found is that I've come to accept that we don't know, but in the meantime what I can do is engage in this, this active hope. And in that process, I believe that we will become the kinds of humans that we are longing to become. Um, it's almost like, well, we can't fail, right? We might as well. What else are we going to do? Go and buy things? I mean, what's the point? Well, that's fascinating. Let's go there. We can't fail. It's not that failure is not an option. It's that we're pretty much locked in our homes or doing a different way of living. In fact, the old way is completely gone. So all we have is a new path forward. And whatever that is, is as radically beautiful as we choose to make it and then step forward into. There's this wonderful irony, and it's funny bringing this up on a sort of a spiritual podcast, but Milton Friedman, who's the founder of contemporary capitalism mm -hmm. or neoliberalism, he said some time back that a crisis can bring about real change. It can disrupt incredibly. Um, but it depends on the ideas that are lying around at the time. Now, that's the opportunity we have right now, okay? You know, we, we have some space and time, we have a disruption. Many of us are having to do a big pivot on our lives and everything that we held dear, we valued has suddenly become redundant. And so we're gonna to have to redirect things to a certain extent. So why don't we do it in such a way where the ideas are better? The ideas are more sustaining, they're more beautiful. It's interesting because I really want to talk about, about loneliness and connection, but one thing I can already hear coming through in the ethos is we may feel less lonely if we have a mission during this time. Correct. Absolutely. Purpose is so important. And I think some of these philosophers that have guided us throughout history, Viktor Frankl, who wrote mm. Man's Search for Meaning, and I'm sure, yes, you're familiar with his with that, with that book, and I'm sure many of your listeners are too, um, you know, he, he really honed it in and, and he was in a crisis, you know, he was in a concentration camp and he wrote this book in nine days after being released. Um, he identified that the people who survived a crisis were the ones that had a meaning, 
you know, and Nietzsche said it beautifully. Um, we can survive any how if we have a why. And I think that's what we, we need to be focusing on right now. Now, what is meaningful to us? That's the question we need to ask. And I think when things are paired back, we start to get a better feel for that. I think we have to go to the wild here because what I'm hearing in my head is I'm hearing is we need the why and that is the driver of everything. I could not agree more. However, in this digital world, it is very mm. easy to be given like fake news to be given an artificial why and actually lose our way. It's distraction. It's distraction. The Romans gave bread and circuses, the Roman emperors, you know, to the to the people so that they wouldn't notice that they were bringing in these draconian laws. And today we have the equivalent. So the, the capitalist system, which keeps us caught up in consumption, which is ruining the planet and ruining our spirit, it throws us these distractions. Now, technology, we can't blame technology. We invented it after all. Well, you and I are talking on Skype halfway around the world. There's a Correct. benefit to this. What has to happen then is, and I say this throughout the book, technology is only ever an enabler. So what do you want it to enable? Currently, we allow it to enable a fair bit of human smallness. And, and we have a weakness as humans. So we have an individualistic urge, and I'm speaking from a very simple bi you know, evolutionary biology point of view, but we have a we have individualism where we want to go and look after ourselves, make sure we are fed and our immediate family are fed and taken care of. But then we also have a need to look after the collective because we don't have fangs, we don't have horns, we don't have a sting in our tail. Mm -hmm. The reason we survive is because we are able to, to unite and to communicate and tell story and, and be stronger than our individual unit. So... It's really important that we look after the collective and we've lost that. We've lost that understanding. And, of course, I, I, I say that the capitalist system has got rid of all the, the, the moral umpires that used to prioritise collectivism. Um, now, technology plays into that. It plays into our individualistic urges. And so what we tend to do is find ourselves going more and more into a silo, become more and more disconnected, ironically, and miserable because our urge is also to be part of this collective. We have the opportunity, however, to get vigilant, to put our own boundaries up to the distraction because nobody's going to come and save us. Apple, Google, whoever it is, they're not going to come and say, hey, listen, we understand that your brains can't cope with this any longer and you're lonely, so we're going to shut down the internet at 6 p.m. each night. You know, I mean, that's not going to happen. That, that era of having these moral umpires is gone, so we need to do it ourselves. And there's all kinds of great people out there, generally from America, who've come up with wonderful hacks for putting up those boundaries. But equally, equally, we also need to get very mindful about using technology in instances like this. We can actually have very deep, concerted, um, reflective conversations using technology. And so that's the option. These are some of the ideas that we want lying around going forward. Here's a, a few thoughts. I was on last night uh, with Ken Honda, amazing author out of Japan, and we had a, a room together where we taught in Clubhouse, this new social oh, yes. media th thing. The two of us spoke. He's in Japan. I'm in California, and we're helping raise consciousness together all around the world. So there are benefits to this. But I, I guess we need to go back to what you did with your business, your profits in 2018, and kicking ourselves out i'm going to use a a, a good uh, a down under turn on walkabout <laughs> yeah, yeah so um i in, uh, as many of you would know just from even just listening to your introduction earlier i had a business called i quit sugar so it started out as a movement uh, a little over 11 years ago now 10 years ago i should say and i wrote this book it became a new york times bestseller i spent a lot of time in the u.s doing interviews and so on. And I built this digital business and millions of people did my program and got off sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And I reached this point and I'd made a commitment to myself when I got very sick. I hit a point where it was a life or death moment and I made a commitment to myself that I would never get caught up in the cycle again. And so I've had all kinds of um, practices in place to ensure that that didn't happen. 
So I made a commitment that I would work this business for five years and if I earned enough money to be able to retire on a minimum wage because I'm a minimalist, I can live off the smell of an oily rag, I lived out of one bag for eight of the last 11 years, Um, then I would shut everything down and give it all to charity and do work that didn't require um, negotiating money. And that's exactly what I did. So 2018, I shut the business down. Everyone was surprised. I sold off the assets and I gave all of that money to a charitable trust, which I now I, I, I now develop charity projects and that money funds it. How did you, this, this is amazing. And, and, and I think you are an incredible beacon of bright light for doing this. With that said, how did you keep yourself... How did you keep your word to yourself? Because it must have been easy yeah. to get on the hedonic treadmill and get on into what I call the disease of more. Let me do one more interview. Let me sell one more product. Let me do one more anything. Such a good question. And I've got an answer which is I feel, feel really true and hopefully will be useful. Um, I had honed the process of sitting and having a conversation with myself. And really that's the theme of my book. The disconnection we feel is that we are not having discerning conversations with ourselves. We're not doing the moral wrestle. To to wrestle morally with yourself is a very noble thing to do and that can create your meaning. So for me, um, I I have a practice where I ensure I check in regularly and I make the hard decisions. Um, I've got practices for ensuring I know what is right for me. I I have this notion of an itch. If I feel an itch and I start to see things in black and white, I know I'm on the wrong track. I also have a wonderful ability or my soul has this wonderful ability to tap me on the shoulder, give me a shove, then give me a massive push and slap me down if... I don't stick to my word. Um, and as you know, I, I interview James Hollis, a wonderful Jungian um, therapist based in Washington, D.C., and I've followed his work for many years. And he said to me, Sarah, our souls are calling us to an appointment with life. Mm-hmm. Now, my soul calls me to that appointment. If I don't show up, it comes and finds me and drags me there. So fortunately, I've had that mechanism and I will get ill. I, my life will just feel deeply uncomfortable until I do what I said I would do. So the other thing is, is that this way of living, minimal living, where I'm not beholden to the dollar, Mm -hmm. becomes extremely charming and addictive after a while. I sort of gamify it and I give all the techniques for how I do that in my book. But my life has flow and elegance and a beauty that is only apparent when you can get rid of all of that that distraction and the clutter and the technology and the, and the stuff that, you know, the bread and the circuses. So it's really become a practice that become, has, has become addictive in a very healthy way. So I suppose there was that. Also, I'll tell you one other thing. When you're in the public eye and you have a reasonably large social media following and you make a big announcement on social media, you can't go back on your word, right? You sort of, you know, it's out there. It's a bit like writing a book about quitting sugar. I can't walk down the street drinking a big container of Coke anytime soon, right? <laughs> so I, I do set up structures, buttresses to ensure I'm held to account because nobody else is going to come and save me. Um, so, so all of these things have contributed, and really, this is the irony. And Seth Godin, a wonderful marketer from your from your wonderful country, he taught me this twelve years ago, um, and and that was to have a practice in your business where you give a certain uh, amount of stuff for free, mm-hmm. and then the abundance comes. So I developed my eight week program, and I gave it away for free for two years. Then, when I came out with my first ebook and charged for it. People very generously bought it and off the movement took. So I've done that and this is the most wonderful irony and everyone listening to this will know that this is not coincidence. This is how the beauty of the world really manifests. I gave my money away. I then got approached just nonstop on the speaking circuit to go and speak to banks, superannuation companies, insurance agencies about how to have a life of value without money. I mean, the irony does not escape. 
I mean, isn't that just beautiful? And, and the money so, came back. I, I, I'm, exactly. I'm guessing the coffers already refilled themselves and you're going, wait a second. There's a formula going on here. Yes, that's right. And, and there's so many different angles that we can go with this. And that, and that is when, when I talk about Ken Honda, the author of Happy Money, who I was, I was on Clubhouse with last night. We were talking about that the ultimate thing that you can do with money is help it to circulate to help others. But it's helping it to circulate. As you put it out there, there's what I call the law of the boomerang effect. It's coming back. Yeah, I mean, money is just, at the moment, in 2021, we live in a world where that is the currency that we value. So if that's what it is, we don't touch value to the, the, the dollar notes. Yeah. We um, attach value to the freedom and the flow that we can create, the dance that we can do. Um, and I think hoarding being small, gripping. I mean, we all know this language from speaking to spiritualists and self-help coaches, right? We know that's a, not a great way to live. And from a health point of view, restriction is really bad for our physical health. So why do we do it with belongings and money? We've got to keep that river, the flow of abundance going. Thank you. So I want to go from there. I want to go to, I'm not going to call it the dark night of the soul. It's not a dark night of the soul. People feel so trapped. Now, I, I'm, I'm in California right now. We, we had to leave Colorado. We're in California. Um, and it, it's weird. It's locked down. It's not locked down. It's back locked down. There's protests. And everybody is feeling flipped upside down and backwards and confused or dancing around the streets as if nothing's going on. It's a really, really weird world at the moment. But for those who are actually locked down, there is such a depth of despair in people's loneliness. And what you got me thinking with the term moral wrestle, and I am not an Old Testament expert to save my life, but I'm thinking of Jacob and God, if I get that right, in the desert, wrestling at night. And that's what you're talking about. And if we can do that wrestling match in lockdown, I think we grow stronger and more empowered and we get to, uh, well, it's... it's uh, I'll get the term, the, the, the Greek term wrong, Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. Yes. Yes. I, I think that's exceedingly important. We have a wonderful opportunity to do that at the moment and we must do it. Um, but I think also part of the dialogue with this is not just, is, is being able to sit in discomfort because part of the, part of the issue that I explore in the book mm. is that we have become cocooned, inoculated from Discomfort. Now, every spiritual tradition throughout history um, has had a reverence for discomfort, but also for sacrifice and for being of service. Um, and there's been initiation ceremonies. And really what they've been geared towards is getting people to take that uh, journey into adulthood. All of those parables are all about truly becoming an adult. And what I would say, and this might be a bit controversial, but I would say that our culture is suspended in a permanent state of adolescence where we are aware of consequences, but then we go, why should I have to do anything? Little Johnny doesn't have to um, put his iPad away at 9 o'clock at night. Why should I? Now, we spend our lives telling children, well, it's not about little Johnny. It's about you becoming the best adult possible. And various traditions have sent young men out into the desert to grapple with life, to find what to, to face themselves. Nothing like a desert, as you would know, <laughs> to really get in touch with your own self, you know. Very few distractions if you're out there. Um, and so we no longer have those practices. In fact, we have the opposite. We actually protect our children from any discomfort. All of our technology of the last 30 years hasn't been geared towards making the world a better place. 80 to 90% of it has been about dialing down discomfort. So whether it's an app that can tell us how long our takeaway pizza is going to be as it works its way through the suburb, or whether it's just um, Google where we don't have to sit not knowing something. We can quickly Google it. This is the world that we live in. And so we have this idea that discomfort, not knowing, uncertainty should not exist. We should, you know, we want to demand a meeting with the manager if there's any kind of discomfort. Instead of having a practice that gets us to sit in the discomfort, absorb the pain and pass through it. And growth, as we know, and we can talk all these spiritual texts, growth only happens 
through the rising up out of friction into a new path. And we have been denied that that pathway because of the way that we live our lives. And we need to reverse that if we are going to be able to cope with that fragmentation or the uncertainty that you talk about. We need to build the resilience muscle once again. I think, I believe, and I love what you're saying, it is being, so if we look at your life and we look at mine, I've had two near-death experiences, many, many steerings with a two by four from the universe. If I don't listen, universe will usher me first quietly and then with a big whack back on track. But this is now to me happening on a global scale. So we are getting the message that the comfort is actually uncomfortable, that a father knows best world, and that's what we're talking about, a father knows best world hurts more than anything. Absolutely. I mean, James Hollis talked this through with me because he works very much at the individual level with the psyche. And I asked him very clearly, is this now playing out globally? And he said, absolutely. Humanity is being called to an appointment with life. We need to come and meet life, which means, Mm -hmm. and as you know, my, my formula in the book for doing that is so simple and beautiful and fun and charming. It's to literally go into nature. And I love that the name of your book, and I know that it um, stands for something else, but awe. Awe is one of the principles of nature that, that it's, it's we... It's the double entendre. That's why mm. it's in there, because mm. it is the jaw-dropping silence of... Mm-hmm. If we are wondering what to do, if we're thinking, where do I start? My absolute first answer is go and look at nature. Nature will give you every answer that you need. And I'm not a tree-hugging sort of, you know, dancing around the campfire type in that sense. I, throughout the book, I obviously have a very keen awareness of the Mm -hmm. spiritual traditions and also my own spiritual practice in nature. And my God is life, is is the universe. That's that's how I define my God. Mm -hmm. Um, But the science now is just coming, cascading in to show how the natural world does what it does. So we know that we go into nature and all of a sudden there's an attunement. And I love that word. And I also love the word congruence. We see patternings. I mean, it's as basic as we, our eyes, our retinas are made up of fractals, these repeating patterns. And then we see them in a petal of a flower, the frond of a fern, um, wave pools, whatever it might be. And there's this, oh, the perfection of life, the patterns. And those fractals are wonderful, uh, a wonderful way to connect with nature. Um, but, yeah, I think we're starting to get a, a realisation of this. And, and, and discomfort, nature shows us that we have to have storms and we have to have all of these things and we need to adjust. And, um, and you know, we also need to see them as signs. I mean, COVID really is, I would say, the medium-sized shelf. You know, that we've had the taps on the shoulder, the bushfires and various other uh, floods and hurricanes. COVID is the shove. Now, are we going to wait until we get flattened, you know, and try to emerge from some impossible ashes? Or are we going to turn up to our appointment with life? Woohoo! You mentioned several of my favorite words here. So I'm doubling, I'm oh, doubling back. I, I agree <laughs> completely with what you're saying. You, sa- you mentioned attunement and congruence. And I'm going to add to that resonance, frequency, and harmony. Which is to say that when we attune to nature, when we get in vibrational alignment, so literally out here in Joshua Tree, you can hear the hum of the earth. You can hear Schumann's resonance. It is so much pow, so much granite under the sand, and not very much else going on that you can feel that hum. And when you do, and you get in vibration with something greater than yourself, Mm -hmm. you become a tuning fork, attuned you become a tuning fork for others around you. And it is a, I want to call it earthly. That's a strange way to put it. It's really heavenly, but I'll call it an earthly wake up call because you become the light for everybody around you. Absolutely. And look, I, I think there's so, it's no coincidence we have all these words 
that describe it. And, and when you hear it in a different context, you go, oh, of course, that's how life works. And again, it makes you have this recognition, you know, and then we get a sense of belonging and meaning. And I just want to extrapolate that out a little further. In the book, I, talk, I have a chapter about um, getting spiritually heavy. Now, spiritualism light, L-I-T-E, is like the diet version of, of the spiritual traditions that have existed for a long time. And spiritualism light is where we cherry pick all the rainbows and unicorns, the meditation and drumming circle stuff, the stuff that makes us all feel dreamy and nice at a very individualistic level. Now, I have no problem with people doing these practices. I do it myself. However, what comes next? Do you walk out of your yoga class or your, I don't know, your, your, your meditation circle and go back to consuming and going and buying your green smoothie in a plastic cup with a plastic straw and stepping over the homeless person who's just asked for a couple of dollars for a drink? Do you do that or do you to take the parable of the monk who comes down from the mountain? The monk who sits up in the cave for years meditating and one day um, just realises, what's the point of all of this if I don't share this with the rest of humanity and be of service? And so he comes down to the village and, and helps out. We are at a point in history where we need to be doing that. We need to step up. And I speak to so many people and, in fact, there's a chapter in the book where I go to Joshua Tree. It's a, actually a really interesting turning point and it's the chapter where I discuss spiritualism light because I go out to Arrowtown, which you'd be very familiar with, and I'm sitting there on my own and I'm watching sort of everybody drinking and eating ribs and all of that kind of thing and I'm listening to a Marianne Williamson uh, podcast and she talks about this, that the spiritual has always been political and I've been ranting about yes. this for years. Gandhi was political. Jesus, political. All these people that we revere, Martin Luther King, um, you know, these, these people were political. And they use spirituality to make their political point and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of people who are in the spiritual realm who go, oh, I'm not into politics. Um, and they shut down because the complexity, the discomfort is too much for them. And Marion in that particular podcast, and I can't remember who was interviewing her, but said, um, you know, there's a responsibility for the spiritual community. If they've done some work, if they've done a bit of that moral wrestling out in the desert, um, to, to help out, to be of service. We need you. And, and that's what I say in the book. Spiritualists, we need you. And it's not enough to dig your head in the sand and say, I don't want to read the newspaper. Digging your head in the sand. I mean, you can call it ego coming in the back door. You can call it just another way of numbing yourself up. I'm actually working right now with uh, Dr. Irvin Laszlo, two-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And we've got a very small group of people working together on a white paper. It'll be presented to the UN called A New Paradigm in Politics, going from the me to the we, going from competition to co-opetition. We need a completely different way of doing things. And you can go, well, what if you put yourself out there? What if you say these radical things? What if somebody calls you a fill in the blank here in the West? We have to do this, and there is no more tomorrow. We're at a true bifurcation of humanity. Do you want to go off the cliff? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to remember who you are and bring things back into balance? And this is a closed system which desires balance, and she will bring it back to balance. You describe storms. Storms. And here in California last year, there were firestorms, dry lightning, thousands of strikes, entire state on fire. Because we can say either Mother Earth is angry or we can say, just as you describe in the book, hey, it's just science. <laughs> this is a closed system yeah. that's going to bring itself back in homeostasis. That's how, that's how Mother Nature works. She is about balance and she will find it. And if humanity gets in the way, we are a blip on the planet. We are a blip in the cycle of life. And if Mother Nature has to kick us off, I think Mother Nature really quite loves humans. I think so. Seasoning. She could have shivered us off, you know, just shaken like we a wet dog. We are so vulnerable. We are so vulnerable. We are the most vulnerable species on the planet. But she has aided us and steered us, and we have not listened. We have thought we are way better. 
we can conquer nature. And as you said, it's that male father knows best mentality. And actually, no. <laughs> actually, no. Um, and we need to listen to that and we need to humble ourselves. There's a whole range of, uh, again, spirit, the spiritualists have taught us this for years and they're the harder parts. They're the spiritually heavy parts of a spiritual practice, humbling, sacrifice, um, you know, going into the dark night of the soul. It's, it's all of that that makes us a morally rich, fibrous species. Um, this is our challenge. This is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. And I speak to a lot of climate scientists mm -hmm. and climate psychologists because I I have wide-ranging interests and like to use all parts of my being to understand things, where it's spiritual or the scientific. But, um, you know, they, they are showing that things aren't looking great for us. And, in fact, you know, the planet, really, to keep going, might need to kick us off. Now, I've got a very strong spiritual practice mm -hmm. And I would actually, this is, I can say it on this show, uh, you know, probably not in too many forums, but I actually would be very disappointed if Mother Nature gave us another free pass, right? Because I'd be like, that's not how Mother Nature works. If she sort of went, hey, humans, um, we're going to sort of like make this okay for you, those 14 tipping points. I'll just make them not tip and, oh, you know, you don't have to reduce your carbon emissions and you don't have to address your horrible consumption and your greed. Um, I would go, ah, oh, my faith in life, gone. It's interesting, Sarah. I have a lot of guilt about this one. The guilt is this. I don't like watching a train wreck and if there's an accident or an ambulance, I'm looking the other way and saying prayers because I don't want to be, we're wired to look at that. We actually get something out of that, a dopamine hit. However, when I see things going back to a new normal, there is no normal. In fact, from a, from a capitalist perspective, it's, it's, it's <laughs> we're getting raked over the coals by the man, whatever that means. But you get what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Uh, yes. Because those who have, have a lot more and everybody else is getting the squeeze. But with that and said- And COVID, I'll just add that yeah. COVID, these new statistics have just come out. COVID has accentuated that divide. So the number of the billion, total billionaire wealth in the world has gone up 27% because of COVID. Top the great 10, we'll, we'll, we'll throw some numbers back and forth. The top 10 billionaires, top 10 uh, wealthiest people on earth since COVID started have gained $400 billion, enough money to pay for a vaccine for everybody and give everybody back the wage that they had before COVID. But yeah. if we want to look at that as a positive, so I'm going to look at it as a positive. It is a, a house of cards that is so unstable. It is unsustainable and will fall. Here's where my guilt lies. Yeah, there sorry, is, I interrupted. No, no, per, it was perfect. My guilt lies that there is a part of me, if I'm honest, and I'm going to say this and try not to be at tears because I don't want anybody to suffer. There's a part of me that says, if this thing tips, that's actually in our best interest. It cannot continue this way. And so when people, uh, when it's able to eke by, there's that weird part of me that's going, I almost don't want it to. And that's really weird and against all of my spiritual beingness, except if I understand the concept that God is. Mm -hmm. Meaning that everything is spirit, everything is divine, everything is happening as it should, and we still get to take action. But there yes. is that yearning and hope and desire going, wake up, people, wake up. Well, I think it's because we are fearful of what the next wake-up call is going to be, yeah. the, the bigger shove, what's it going to be? And um, I, there's a little poster, um, there's a graffiti artist that works in my area and there was a poster down the road. Ironically, it was there for a long time until a construction company came and knocked down the wall and it said, Daddy, uh, what did you do to fix the climate crisis? And it broke my heart every day that I walked past it because I thought in five years' time, I don't want all the people I love to go, oh, my God, I didn't see this coming. We could have done something. I, you know, I suppose 
what do I want to achieve from my work, from my books, from doing podcasts like this? I want to give everyone the opportunity to see what's happening and to make a choice. I don't want people to feel that they didn't know, that they weren't given that opportunity. You call it kamikaze mode, and I don't believe that's your term, but you call it kamikaze mode, and I call it the kitchen sink. And I want to go to the, the Iroquois Confederacy Constitution, and they talk Please. about seven generations. However, I think that humanity can't think in terms of seven generations. We can barely even think in terms of one generation. But Daddy, can you do everything in your power and can you do it now? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that they use daddy because in the climate mobilization movement and in the spiritual movement, women are dialed in. They're on board. We have a, we have a male prop, a masculine problem in the environment movement. We have a um, masculine the, problem. Let's it, it, now, now, now uh, clearly I, I, I'm male, so I'm not trying to pick on, on myself or anything, but we have a masculine problem with everything. We've gone from an age of the uh, four of the condor to the eagle. Now we've got to become a combined yin and yang. And instead we're right. stuck in this masculine do economic growth mode. That's right. And it's just balance. It's, as you say, it's just balance. And I love, and you'd probably know this kind of story about Kali, the, mm. the Indian goddess. Her um, fierceness, she, her rage. Oh, I Carly rage. My God, is it needed right now? So, for anyone who who's listening, please go and either look in my book. I've got to. I tell the story of it, but go and look it up in Wikipedia or something. But Carly um, is this goddess that's, that is is sort of inserting to other goddesses and brought down to earth. And she comes out in a woman, in a strong, beautiful woman. She emerges when a man is abusing Mother Nature or abusing women. So in this particular parable is that she comes down and she, I think it's Shiva is being a lazy, he's an he's a army general and he's on the battlefield and he's meditating too much. I mean, I just love it, right? He's sitting around meditating. The soldiers are all being a bit flaccid. And he, the gods deliver him this beautiful wife, um, Shakti. I, mm-hmm. I, I might have that back. No, no, no. You've, got, got, you've right. got that right, Shakti. Perfect. Shakti comes down and she's beautiful and she's this wife. And, and she says, look, I'm only going to do it um, if you respect me, if you respect me as a woman. Anyway, he starts to get disrespectful. He starts disrespecting nature. And anyway, the deal is Carly emerges and she's got men's severed heads skulls around her neck and she's got multiple daggers in multiple hands and she comes down and she goes onto the battlefield and she wipes the heads off all these soldiers that are sitting around abusing Mother Earth, not defending the feminine. And she's got the the dagger above um, uh, Shiva and Shiva gets the message and goes, okay, all right, recorrection, let's go and look after Mother Earth again. We've got some Kali rage going on. What else is a firestorm? What else is a tornado? What else is a pandemic? But a bit of, you know, Kali rage. And I think it's these parables, these patterns, these understandings have existed for a long time. And I find that very comforting, you know, to know that this is, this is how life goes. Do we want to join it or do we want to resist it? How do we take that Kali rage and start to focus it or hear, now clearly I talk about our process, automatic writing in our book, hear from spirit. How do we begin to hear the calling, the pull, the tug that's on our heart if we are so numbed up by our devices, by our yoga? And I'm not picking on yoga. Yoga is freaking awesome. But when we use these things to escape from what is, how do we without the two by four, which Mother Earth is really gently whapping pretty hard. How do we wake ourselves yeah. up? There's a run, number of practices. Um, I think uh, I writing to yourself is definitely one of them. I have a phrase, soul nerding. Soul nerding is actively applying yourself to the process of, of learning about big minds who have written about this stuff before. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've mentioned a few names. Nietzsche. Nietzsche has written about this through a particular lens, pretty tortured one, but he was writing about the perils of capitalism and individualism run rampant without the moral umpire role of religion on the 
football field um, back in the late 1800s. Um, you know, there's there's incredible philosophers, existential philosophers. So I particularly like Virginia Woolf and I, Jean-Paul Sartre, and they all have their faults. Hannah Arendt, this wonderful moralist, German existentialist who wrote about, she attended the uh, the Nazi trials uh, in the 1950s sort of and 60s. Um, and she has these wonderful philosophies, Eric Fromm. So, and the Stoics, we can learn much from the Stoics as well. Um, so I think applying ourselves, treating it as a study. Eric Fromm says, um, treat life as a study in work and love. And I interpret that as connection and being of service. Yeah. There's a, a term that I've, I've kind of stolen from Ram Dass, to snuggle up with. And, and I like to say to snuggle up with life, snuggle up with your discomfort. I, I'm, I'm using Henry the tortoise here as a snow globe. <laughs> and I like to yeah. say that we want to snow globe our lives. What are we doing? Where are we at? Where are we going? What are we feeling? If we peel away the layers of all of the distraction, what are we feeling in the inside and what is calling us forth to something greater than ourselves, which actually is ourselves. But to examine life with a desperation that one who has not oxygen gasps for, gasps for their next breath. Yeah. Yeah. And look, if anyone's listening and wants to know pragmatic stuff, it's yeah. not necessarily anything new, but this is what I do. I exercise in the morning to open up my yeah. physical body. I then meditate after that. And I don't give myself a hard time if it's only five minutes. It is good to be vigilant, but I go through waves of that being appropriate and not being appropriate. Um, I will often, sometimes if I'm discombobulated, if I'm starting my day in a way that's just not centred, I will sit down and I have these notebooks yep. and I just, I free write. And it's a mess, but it doesn't matter what I write, but I'm just having a conversation with myself. Mm -hmm. I'm snuggling up to, I'm snuggling up to myself and my values. I then start my day. I work, I start early and then I try to finish um, a little a little early so that I can ensure that I have a practice for resting my physical body um, and I often have podcasts late at night and that kind of thing. I have a regular check-in with myself and I generally do it via hiking. So most weekends I'll head off mm -hmm. just into bushland and I connect with nature. And people say, oh, how do you choose the perfect hike? What's your favourite hike? And I always answer, I've never had a bad hike. My favourite hike is my next hike. There is no risk, right? Going into nature, you will be rewarded. So I know this works. So I have these practices that ensure that I go into that space. I always have a book at the moment. It's The Prophet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I just have it as a companion. And so whenever I've got to go to a meeting, I've got to sit somewhere and wait for a bit or um, whatever it might be, I just have a book that I will read passages just to get me into that space. Soul nerding. This is soul nerding. And there'll just be different books. There might be a podcast series where I know if I listen to it or I read it, I go into that space of connection. So I look for these things. I also have, this is a very fundamental thing, I, I, whenever I feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I get this cringy black and white fuzzy feeling, I stop. It's my trigger. It's the, it's the most perfect gift I've ever been given. I stop and I go, what's going on? What's going on? Okay. That's annoying me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And it might take a while. It might take weeks, months for me to work out what I'm going to do, but it becomes the dialogue. And so I just, the discomfort is my trigger. Brene Brown once said to me that she has a, often keeps an elastic band or she uses her wedding ring. Mm -hmm. She gives it a twist when she's feeling uncomfortable. And it's just, we've got to have these like little things, these little practices, because we don't have a broad-based social, spiritual practice going on. So we can develop them from ourselves by cherry-picking from all the spiritual traditions and find our own, and snuggle up to our own spiritual practice. Thank you, and thank you for sharing. And, and, and what's so empowering about this, and I love that you use the term soul nerding. I love geeking out on 
all of this. To me, this is life. This is, I'm a kid in a candy store. I, I want to learn about this. I want to learn about that. How can we change this? What can we do here? And to me, that's the fun. That's living. And what you're doing is, is, is you're linking. You're linking the, I feel uncomfortable. This is so empowering for people listening. I feel uncomfortable. It's not, I feel uncomfortable. Let's turn on uh, uh, the tube and numb ourselves out. I feel uncomfortable. Let's go so, get some brownies. I feel uncomfortable. I'm going to look at this sucker. I'm going to talk yeah. to myself. I'm going to learn about it. This is the good stuff. This is the juice. Exactly. It's, it's absolutely right. It's very much changing the dialogue from I'm uncomfortable, something must be wrong. And as you know, I wrote that book, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, about yes. anxiety. And the beast obviously being anxiety. I wrote a book that was about making it a beautiful thing, this incredible superpower. You know, I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was 21, living in California, actually. I was on scholarship studying at Santa Cruz. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, I was told I had something wrong and I was given pills for many years. And eventually I went, actually, I think I can do this better. So it was very much about reframing it. When I get anxious now, it is my gift. It tells me Thank I'm on the you. wrong track. And I was diagnosed several times with ADHD as a child and as a young adult. And I was medicated several times before I said, wait a second, I can do this better. I can actually use that throttle forward, use it when I want, throttle back, use it to drop in and dive even deeper. Yeah. Those, that, those things, and, and I, am, I am driven nuts by nabl- labels. However, those things that we are told are our biggest challenges are actually our greatest gifts. Absolutely, and it's a choice. And F. Scott Fitzgerald said this beautiful thing. He said he was, it was a letter that he was writing to a young person, and I think it was his nephew or something, and giving him advice. His young nephew was going through a tortured, what am I doing with my life phase? I love how life doesn't change, right? And he wrote to him and said, look, you'll be pleased to know you're not the first person to go through it. And even better, some great humans have written about it. You know, and we need to find our own way. But gosh, the best thing about humanity is we, th- those who have been the most tortured, those who've gone to the darkest places, have written the most beautiful stuff or written, produced the most beautiful artwork. And all of it can help us. Um, and so it's a two way thing. You don't have to be alone in this journey. You know, there's people like us who write books that try to help others um and it's a wonderful investigation what else are you going to do with this one wild and precious life like really you know why not make it a study in life in, in love and work Woohoo! a couple quotes coming to me one i've written down the other one i'm sure you know it and can riff off of it john muir thousands of tired nerve nerve shaken over civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity. And then the next line I'm hearing from a quote, and I can't recall who it is, found out, it might be Rumi, that going out was going in. I think it was Rumi. I think we can safely assume Rumi said a version of that. I mean, he's got a quote for every circumstance, contemporary or, or um, of, of the past. Absolutely. Um, I think that going into nature is the best salve ever and um, I think we need to start to return to ourselves. We need to return to the connection with each other, with ourselves and with life and it's not as hard as we think. We are so overwhelmed thinking how are we going to solve this and really um, nature tells us it's It's so simple. We just need to join them. You know, there's that beautiful phrase I use in the book, group soul. Mm -hmm. The naturalist couldn't work out what made a murmuration of birds suddenly dart left or right. Who was the leader? Who determined it? And they used the phrase group soul. And we need to unify with that, attune with it again. I'm guessing you wrote, and, and I just wrote down one attunement at a time, I'm, which is, there's an irony and a paradox to that statement. But I'm guessing you have spent time sitting like sitting on the beach with a giant flock of birds and just tuned in with them because you can actually tell which direction they go. Your body will start to move and get in sync with them. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I, I I wrote this in the bit where I wrote about uh, Joshua Tree. I did one of the hikes up the mountain. What's the mountain in the middle of Joshua Tree called? The famous uh, one that people go and I actually, I, I live right outside of it. We spend very little time inside. So I couldn't, because we stay where there are no people. Ah, okay. Well, you know what? The funny thing is there was no one up there. When I, everyone went to the car park, took a photo and left, I was the only person out there. It was awesome. also a stifling hot day and the park ranger told me I shouldn't be hiking. But anyway, but I write about sitting with a mountain and I sit with a mountain and its knowingness is palpable. If you sit with a mountain for some time, there's this beautiful kind of dreamy sense that you get of just gazing out this this knowledge and uh, I think there's so many ways as you say where you do start to move with where the natural flow of things goes I mean anyone who's a swimmer an ocean swimmer a river swimmer you start to get the motion the movement of the waves and the, and it's it's not a struggle Thank you. And I'm thinking, and it's been, it's been a while. We, we are what we call mountain ocean people. So we lived in Maui. We came back to Colorado. We've lived mm-hmm. on the outer banks of North Carolina, and now we're in the desert. And oh, the feeling of being with the flow and the water and going out there, not just on the calmest days, because there is a peace under the surface, even when on top. It's yeah. frothing to and fro. So there's so much we can talk about. So I've, I've, I've got to begin to wrap things up with you here. Uh, this is so exciting to me. I'm so glad you're here today. Where can people go to find out more, Sarah, and to find your beautiful This One Wild and Precious Life and to find your podcast? Well, the best place is probably sarahwilson.com. Mm-hmm. Um, everything's there. But um, I think, I mean, This One Wild and Precious Life is in all bookstores on Amazon. Barnes and Noble, the independent stores. Um, and uh, my podcast is called Wild with Sarah Wilson. I've only just started it. Um, that's on all ver- podcast platforms. But yeah, and then Instagram, if you look up Sarah Wilson, you'll find me. Fantastic. Before I let you go, it's two last questions. First off, when you have felt most alone, what has been... I know it's gonna. It, it, we've been talking about nature, but what is one practice, maybe a practice everybody can do today that you've done when you felt most alone to reconnect? It's going to surprise you. It's an oddity, but often I need to break the, the predictable. Mm-hmm. I will go, and this is what I've done. I did it in Maui. Um, I've done it around the world. I will be a 47-year-old woman who goes and sits in a bar on my own I'll either order a cup of tea or a glass of wine. I'll sit there. I'll get a serviette, a paper serviette or a piece of paper, the back of a docket, and I just write. I just write. And I sit there in the discord. And so that is that is often what I'll do. I write to myself. I think it is one of the most – and, look, I'm saying it to the right person, right? I write to myself. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I would say – it gets me into that melancholy space. Melancholy is a wonderful emotion. I did it only the other day. I went and sat at a little place down the road and do you know what? There were three other women yes. sitting in the restaurant doing exactly the same thing. One was listening to a podcast, one was writing, one looked like she was listening to music. So I wrote a note to one of them, gave it to the waiter and it just said, I hope you're enjoying yourself. And uh, she, she gave me a wave. Beautiful. So instead of asking any last words of wisdom, I've got to ask, and it's very different than the movie Matrix, a very different meaning to it, the woman in red. Oh, yes. Well, that's, it's a nice segue. The woman in red was a woman I came across in a very dark place at a very big fork in the road moment. I won't give it away. You'll have to read the book to know where I was at. And she was a youngish woman, I'd say in her early 30s, sitting in a cafe on a stifling hot day in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And she was sitting there just quietly and peacefully staring out into the town square. And she had a coffee. And I was sitting there and I watched her for about 45 minutes. I was reading, wrestling with myself. I had a very big decision to make that day, uh, a life-changing decision. And uh, I watched her and eventually I went over and I said, can I ask, what are you doing? And she said, on public holidays like this, I like to come and sit and just watch and think. And I posted a photo of her, and for anyone interested, you can scroll down. I've reposted the photo because everybody wanted to see a photo of this woman. 
But at the time when I was travelling and writing the book, I posted a photo and so many people have asked me about her because she symbolises uh, a space, a, a way of being that we want to return to, to have an ability to sit there and to be cool alone, to be cool alone, to be cool with our aloneness because um, that's not lonely. And, in fact, all the spiritualists have said we need to be alone to actually conquer our loneliness. And so that is an art form. It's a practice. It's something that we, I think it's a noble thing to pursue is to be able to be cool alone. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Sarah. I think you've done a lot of good today on multiple levels. This is one to go back and listen again and again. <laughs> we've got earth, we've got soul, we've got spirit. What's the difference? There's a question for another day. We've got healing one's heart and by healing one's heart and getting in attunement, healing this entire planet as well. So I cannot thank you enough for joining us here today. My pleasure. Sarah. I've enjoyed it thoroughly and um, all of my love to my friends uh, in the United States. Here in Australia, we, we watch what you're going through very closely and, um, and, and admire you and feel for you and wish you courage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get this one wild and precious life and begin rediscovering your wild and precious life today. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much, Sarah. <laughs> this was beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for asking the good, juicy, meaty, wonderful, nourishing questions. I really appreciate it. What I liked so much about this interview with Sarah is we talked about going out to go within, but we also talked about taking your power back by getting in touch with what's real. And to me, that's so important. So we have this, this disease of complacency. We also have this disease of loneliness. And it's no coincidence that they exist side by side or hand in hand. And the way to break this spell of loneliness and of complacency and of feeling that we are helpless to do anything, I believe is by getting out. As soon as you get back in touch with the natural world, you truly start to wake up. So I love this interview. I recommend listening to it again and again. On that note, if you want to dive into your soul, if you want to hear the deepest words from your inner wisdom, and you want to be able to put pen to paper and ask questions of the universe, where am I going? What am I doing? How do I make a difference? that I cannot recommend enough getting on the automatic writing experience, a process that teaches you how to go into your soul, to write to spirit, to write to the divine, to write to your inner wisdom and say, what do I do from here? What do I need to know? Who am I? You can get it at Amazon. Please ask for it at your local retailer. I want to support the local stores no matter what, above and beyond all else. And you can find our program, video-based program and live classes at automaticwriting.com. So to check out more incredible shows, click here, subscribe below. Be sure to click on that bell icon to be notified of shows, upcoming premieres and live events every Sunday night with me. Big thumbs up if you like to share with the world and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys.